Well, retail is tough. That's why. If you ever watch Shark Tank, they just run from retail. This is the e-commerce brain trust, a podcast about building momentum online for established consumer brands. Join our hosts and their expert guests for high-level conversations about e-commerce strategies, trends, and innovations. Access our brain trust and boost your brand's e-commerce potential. Welcome back to the show. This is Kiri Masters. And today, Noelle Barnes and myself interview Dave Maddock from Toink Toys. And we did this interview with Dave at Channel Advisors Catalyst Conference in San Diego earlier in April. And so we sat down with Dave. Unfortunately, we did not have a particularly soundproof area to record this interview in. So you will hear a little bit of ambient noise, but I hope it feels like you were kind of at the conference listening to the food trolleys get carted away. (laughs) It is a really great interview. Some of the things I found really fascinating about talking with Dave is one, he was right there from the beginning with Toink Toys, which is a true omni-channel retailer. They have a couple of retail stores, international stores actually. They sell on their own website. They sell on marketplaces. They actually sell on 24 marketplaces. And a good plug for the the, the host of this conference, Channel Advisor. They use Channel Advisor to work across those 24 marketplaces. 60% of Toink Toys' business is through Amazon, that's worldwide, and they have a very good international component to their business, which helps to diversify their revenue and maximize their potential sales to customers elsewhere. But as you'll find out, there is obviously a lot of complexity with running an international business, and Dave gets into some of those. So we also talk about the concept of selection in the toy category. And if you were struggling to figure out what to buy your kids for Christmas last year, just imagine what Toink Toys has to do. They follow toy fairs around the country. They have people who are dedicated to buying uh, across their different toy categories, figuring out what's hot. We have a really great story about a surprising product that went viral. And Toink is always on the edge of trying to figure out what's going to be hot hot and carrying enough inventory of, of those items, but then obviously not over exhausting their, their capacity, their fulfillment capacity and their capital with that inventory. So it is a challenging business. And as Dave says in the interview, if you watch Shark Tank, there's a reason why they run away from retail. <laughs> so kudos to Dave and the team at Toink Toys for pushing through for 16 years with a very successful toy retail business. And thank you again, Dave, for coming on the show and sharing your story and some of the insights that you've gleaned from so many years running running this business. Hope you enjoy this interview from Dave Maddock at Toink Toys recorded at Channel Advisors Catalyst Conference in San Diego. So today we're interviewing Dave Maddock, Director of E-Commerce at Toink Toys. Toink Toys was started in 2001 by three co-founders who left the corporate grind to develop a company centered on fun products. And uh, Toink is a retailer that sells costumes, toys, and collectibles. You have about 60,000 SKUs, right? Uh, About that, yeah. yeah. It fluctuates. Yeah. With a team that ranges between 40 to 200 plus people, the company has a 110,000 square foot warehouse and a small retail store located in Addison, Illinois. So we wanted to interview Dave while we're at Catalyst today because Toink sells to customers through the physical store, an online store, and 20 marketplaces worldwide. And we think the world is shrinking in terms of customers being able to shop cross-border and for brands to be accessing international customers. But there's still plenty of challenges, both logistic and marketing. So we wanted to get Dave on and grill him about how he makes it work at Toink. So welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So tell us a little a bit about Toink, maybe stuff that we didn't cover off in your in your bio and how you came to arrive at Toink and what you do today. So I arrived at Toink in 2001, a few months after uh, my brother and his college friends started the company. 
starting at uh, actually customer service. We all kind of did everything, packing boxes, customer service, shipping out of the mini storage unit, basically working 24 hours straight, sleeping for four, and then repeating. Back then, we were just on eBay and uh, not on Amazon yet, but mainly eBay and our website. And uh, I think the only thing that you missed was we also do 175 Comic-Cons a year. So that has kind of, we started in online retail and we're almost reversing it the last five years by doing more, I wouldn't call, I wouldn't say brick and mortar, but it's a version of brick and mortar. So 175 worldwide, including Australia. So that way we can, we can, those are our customers, that's our core base. So we listen to the, what they're asking for, listen to what they're talking about, and uh, we can source products from that. Right. Reversing the, the online trend. Right. We're actually going more brick and mortar now. It's, it's almost at least 30, 40% of our business. Is brick and mortar now? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so is that brick and mortar defined as those comic cons or are you actually finding more actual physical no, stores year round? We or? have, so in the Addison Warehouse, Addison Warehouse is 100,000 square feet and the storefront is about a thousand square feet. It's not meant to be a store. It's just back in the day when we first started, manufacturers wouldn't sell to us unless we had a brick and mortar location. (laughs) So we just put a storefront in the warehouse and called it a store Uh because everyone thought online would be e-commerce would be dead. Yeah. That's that's the attitude back in 2001. So these can match, so here in San Diego, the largest Comic-Con, it's literally a mobile store. So we, we build out the entire with the pegs and the, the figures and the grids. So it's a, it's a mobile store. Each like Comic-Con will have three different locations in the hall. And then, yeah, that's, so it's, it is a, a mobile brick and mortar, I would say. Yeah. So given the, the product mix that you have and how that works with your brick and mortar and online retail strategy, how has that defined the mix of online channels that you've had over the years? Like how do you, how, how Amazon heavy are you? How Newegg heavy are you and how does that has that changed over time or are you very amazon heavy or we are too amazon heavy but that's why we use software like channel advisor because we can get on as many marketplaces as we can just to diversify so if amazon decides to suspend us one morning we're not all of our eggs are in one basket so that's why we're on 24 right now and we just see it as getting our products in front of as many eyes as possible we list all of our products in every marketplace so it's uh, they're all we kind of treat them all the same. Your Amazon question: We're about worldwide Amazons. We're about sixty percent of our online business. So it's heavier than I like, but what can you do? It's the new world. Yes. <laughs> and how do you break thing? How do you break down your U.S. sales versus international? Off the top of my head, the the number is probably. I'm, I'll just speak online. I'm not not trade shows. It's probably seventy percent U.S. And you have a you have an operation a subsidiary in Australia as Australia. well. Yep, we do have a, a, a warehouse in Australia in Adelaide, and then we do we do fulfillment our own for uh, for Amazon UK, Germany, Italy, Spain, uh, and France. You're you're sending inventory from the US over. We ship we ship individual orders to Amazon customers, but we also utilize FBA for UK and soon to be Australia. <laughs> the demand is there. Yes. And so how much does that blend influence your product development and what you're sourcing, what you're bringing in, the new SKUs that you launch? When you, when you look at the Comic-Con versus brick and mortar versus online and you, you've, got, you've got to know what sells well. Well, every, every country is going to be slightly different. Mm-hmm. So certain things that sell here won't sell in Australia or won't sell in the UK, mm-hmm. vice versa. We, the product sourcing is, is mainly trends. Uh, for example, Ready Player One, the movie that just came out, we're, we're trying to expand that product line ourselves, meaning we're trying to manufacture. There's not a lot of licensing going on right now. So we're trying to manufacture off of that license and, and you have to beat other people to the manufacturing. So a unique assortment is what, what our customers want. They want something that they haven't seen before, but based on the brands and licenses they, lo- they like, TV shows, movies, video games. And so speed to market is important. Yes, yeah. very. It's, it's, it can be a short-lived life. Although there are long lived life, Minecraft comes to comes to mind. No one thought it would be this hot for literally three years. Our top selling SKUs are still Minecraft. So let's talk a bit about the Han Solo ice cube trays story from a few years ago. 
I know that predicting demand, you know, that, that toy spiked out of the blue. Predicting demand in the toy industry must be crazy because something will just suddenly take off. How do you stay nimble and flexible with your inventory and your manufacturing so that you can ensure that you're, you keep your ranking on Amazon and you keep inventory in house and, and for other online retailers as well? I mean, how do you, how do you play that game? How do you, how do you stay out in front of something when you see something take off? It's, it's tough. I mean, that's what the buyers do. They, they go to the, uh, the trade shows to um, check out the new products. But again, it's very, very difficult to, to predict what's going to be hot. I mean, the Han Solo ice cream trays, no one can predict that. It's oh. right. They're, they're, I mean, they're really cool. And I'm not a big Star Wars fan. It's a good movie, but um, <laughs> but no one, can, no one can predict that. So you just have to keep your finger on the pulse as much as possible in all aspects. And that's, again, that's what the trade shows help us with. When, so Steve, the CEO of Toink, uh, the original founder, he goes to a lot of these shows not necessarily working them, but he sets up his laptop, like basically treats it like Starbucks and in the back of the booth. And he can hear people, what they ask for. Do you have this? Do you have this? And three or four people in an hour ask for that, then starts looking into it. So you have your own brand of toys now. Can you tell us a bit about that, why you launched it and how your success has been so far? So we have a couple different aspects of that. First, we do some toys over the years. We did the, the Lemmy motorhead figures and the Motley Crue bobbleheads. But now we're doing more, we're, we're kind of partnering with manufacturers that already have the licenses. So if they have the Marvel license and we have an idea, say, can you do this for us? And we have to hit a minimum order amount. And so that way we don't have to go through the whole license royalty process and trips to China and all that. So we can just use their manufacturing license relationship. And, um, and, and as long as we meet their minimum orders, we're, we're good. Okay, so I wanted to ask you about your international expansion and a little bit about the journey of of how that came about because when you first got started, I imagine that you were mostly selling domestically. So could you tell us a little bit about the journey to start international expansion what and what that looks like over time? When we first started in, shipping internationally, which we did start at the at the very beginning, it's actually pretty scary just because the shipping, not the tracking numbers don't really go further than some of them will go into the country just when they get to the border and that's it. So you just like, hopefully it gets to the person. So a lot of lost packages, a lot. And when you're starting out, even a $50 order yeah. that you have to refund and you're not sure if they're going to get it two weeks later, it, it hurts. So it's a risk, but I mean, it's, it's, there's a big market out there, so you just kind of have to take that risk. Amazon FBA helped reduce that risk a little bit. Right. But then they start hitting you with the long-term storage fees, which can take all that away. Yeah. So where did you go first? And, like, which countries did you go to first and which marketplaces? We started on eBay originally, and so we, we shipped anywhere eBay advertised. So um, the orders were few and far between for international, a lot of fraud. We started learning about fraud and, and, and all that, uh, w- where people would purposely place fake orders, um, mm. but and our website as well. It, it was a gamble. It's really all that. You just have to test the grounds. There are certain countries you want to avoid just based off history of if nine out of 10 are fraud, then you just don't. You're just not going to deal with it. Right. So. And so what, what do you think the biggest challenges for U.S.-based retailers and brands today? Like what, what would you have told your earlier self and, and co-founders? Uh, I would say focus on the, the, the best selling products and not try to carry everything to focus, uh, find out what margin you want to make profit and, and stick to those prices just because the competition out there right now is there's on any given listing, there's 50 other sellers for a toy. So pick the products where there's fewer sellers, good Amazon ranking, and just focus on the, get rid of the losers and keep the winners basically. And to go back to Noel's point before about building your own brand and the reasons behind that, how much of a how much of a defensive play is your new is your new brand? Uh, it's mainly defensive, just just because it, it removes any any competitors. Of course, you'll get knockoffs eventually, but you just need to move on to the next product. Just keep we'll just keep making products that people want and and beat them to the to the manufacturing table. And this is interesting because you, as a retailer, have been reselling other brands for a long time. Now that you have your own brand, has that changed your perspective on the retail model and other resellers? Well, retail is tough. That's why if you ever watch Shark Tank, they just run from retail. 
it's a tough game, and especially now when you have all this artificial intelligence and we price our engines. I mean, you could put it at twenty dollars, but if you have a price run, it, it'll chip away a penny at a time until it's ten dollars. So yeah, it's it's difficult to to stay on top of things, especially under pricing. You need you need to stick firm to your margins, and and um, that's where our own products we could uh, stick with that. Do you see becoming more of your business as as things move yeah, along? We we do definitely just because the manufacturers. Back when we first started, would only sell to if you had a brick and mortar, if you were in business for more than two years, or it was it was a lot of criteria. Now they're struggling, so they want to sell to anyone and everyone. Whether it's your, they have a hundred or hundred dollar minimum order, so anyone can place an order with them these days. Yeah. And they're doing Not drop them, shipping, them. you know, that, the drop, they're right. helping you can, anyone. You can run a Amazon business out of your. Well, many people do out of your basement yep. and just. FBA everything, um, and the, and you can live off of a dollar profit per order. Um, when we have full time employees, two warehouses, we can't do that. So yeah, back to your other question is probably stay smaller, less overhead. Yeah. So how do you grow in that environment? Is it mm. more SKUs? Is it is it more marketplaces? What is? How do you? I think it's a combination of both. Um, as I was saying, the more eyes, the better. I mean, we don't discriminate on marketplaces. It's it's. It's a marketplace. It's what it is. It's um, a lot of marketplaces will, I, I won't name names, but they'll say, can you list more SKUs? Can you put more SKUs? And like, you, you have them all. <laughs> all. 60,000 not enough for you? Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, they just think that we hold back for particular market, but it's just not true. Why not list them all? Now, some manufacturers have blocking rules. You can't list them on certain marketplaces. So we do have to watch out for that. So is, is that a fairly common scenario that you found with brands that you're working with that they want to have exclusivity in certain for certain marketplaces like eBay and Amazon and they come to you and say we don't want you selling on Amazon anymore uh, it's not that they want exclusivity they, they certain marketplaces for them marketplaces in general like if you go to the International Toy Fair in New York you walk the floor and there's there is manufacturers that have signs no Amazon sellers mm. or no Walmart sellers. They they think that tarnishes their brand mainly because their prices chip it down to nothing. But a lot of manufacturers have map pricing, the minimum advertised price right. to protect that. Unless what? you're selling to Amazon directly. <laughs> right. But what I've seen is all of these companies that say up front to us, no Amazon or no Walmart, either a couple of years later, they say, go ahead, no problem. Or they're selling direct to Amazon or to, you know, to Walmart. So they give in to the to the um. yeah well that's what we find with with our clients is often they will let their distributors and, and resellers run wild because they're selling more wholesale to them so that they don't mind so they don't mind who gets the sale because they have a wholesale model and the reason why they end up going direct on amazon and and changing their their terms is that they want to have price control and content control as well right so if, they're, if their brand's not being represented consistently across channels, then that's a reason for them to get back in and start going direct. Right. And we have no, we never had a problem with map pricing or anything like that. It, it protects them and it protects us too. The only thing we try to do is put a limit on it. Say after 12 months, map is gone. Just because okay. if the item's not selling right. and we have a thousand in stock, yeah. we don't want to keep map. We want to get rid of it, use the cat for something else. Yep. Fair enough. Great. So we just to close out our session today, we have a couple of fun questions for you. What has been the most surprising best-selling toy you've ever had? The most surprising? I would say the cat lady action figure. It's exactly what it sounds like. <laughs> it's a cat lady with little cats all over her head and her shoulders. Our first order was 12, and I think our next order was 1,200. Oh, my God. <laughs> and Yeah, and it's a consistent... 1200 every time every couple months wow it's just, yeah it's it's crazy it's an hilarious and normally this is why i'm not a buyer i'm terrible at picking toys mm -hmm. and usually what i like our customers won't yep. but I, that's i like that one yeah. it, was, it was funny i like that whole line it was accoutrements it's hilarious so here's one other question for you if you had to send a toy to Jeff Bezos, what would you send him? I would probably, so at the conventions we do, we do a lot of mystery boxes. So because Amazon's such a mystery, I would probably send him a mystery box. He'd probably love it. <laughs> <laughs> he, won't, he won't let us know anything about Amazon. And <laughs> <laughs> right back at you. Yep. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us on the show, Dave. Thank, Thank you. you.